I want to thank everyone for uh, for coming. Um, and I first have to thank the wonderful folks here at the Photo Shelter for giving us uh, their space. Um, and I have to thank Rachel and Jeremy and Sienna. I'm saying her name right, because and my uh, my friend Andy for uh, for allowing us to have the space. And Andy will give a little bit of a, a speech in between presentations tonight. Um, and I thank I thank Photo Shelter. I always thank uh, Pro Photo Daily, American Photography, and uh, Epson for helping us out throughout the uh, throughout the years. Uh, tonight we have two presenters, uh, Alec Vigneault and Bob Carey, and, and I will keep it short. Bob, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Um, so, thanks, Frank, for having me. And um, so, trying to figure out what to say, and I think with the environment the way it is, with photography the way it is, with um, when probably most of us started years ago in photography. It, I started when I was 17 and um, started my commercial studio when I was 32. But uh, for me, photography was what I knew when I saw my first print come up in the developer. I mean, I saw that, put the print in the fixer and went and bought more paper to print all of my negatives because I thought that it was so, so, so magical. Um, I've been starting, I have a really great photo book collection and I've been starting to look at that more because of all the content that's out there and, and to look at why I do what I do and, and know that there's still an importance to what we do for ourselves, I think, because I do a lot of my work, my personal work for my own um, well-being and my sanity um, as a form of self-therapy. I started in uh, photographing myself in 1994 after my mom passed away. She passed away in 89. It took me about three years to start grieving her. Um I was, uh, I have a background in photography, but a, in art photography, but it wasn't because that's what I wanted. It's because you didn't have to take a math class and my mom wanted me to go to school. And all I wanted to be is a commercial photographer. So I moved into my studio in 1994. I was photographing a baby on a red background and I was floating fall leaves from monofilament. And I went into the bathroom and had the monofilament in my hand and the lights above the mirror. And I just started wrapping my head. I was waiting for a Polaroid to process. Wrapping my head and it, it felt kind of like I was being held or I was being comforted <clears throat> until it wasn't anymore. And so I knew when I saw that, that, and the feelings I started getting because of everything I was feeling, the next day I had my assistant come in and we did a picture. And once I did this picture and I, I would cut the, I would cut the Polaroid up and then put it on a four by five card, you know, when you get out of the box and then I just look at it, you know, by my bed and, kind of chew on it for a little while, but this was like, I knew that I needed to make these pictures. And so the next day she came in and we started making these pictures. And back in the nineties, I was booked three, three weeks ahead of time, but I was still making time at night to do my personal images. And it was like something I had to do. And, um, this is 
the first image I did. This is in 1994. And this was kind of just the beginning of it all. And it was, and I think that uh, it was just really important. Um, it just seemed like every time I did one of these images, I would end up crying. You know, it was like really a dark time. And, but I just kept doing it. And, um, and I'm, this, I'm, I'm have, silver makeup on and I use monofilament a lot. That's just going through my mouth. Um, and I used to go to a really great salvage yard in Phoenix and I would find shapes and aluminum and I had my grinder and I would have my file and I, you know, made it and I put like a mouthpiece on the aluminum with hot glue and then just sucked it into my mouth and, um, and I was always shaving my head. And I got to the point where I was shaving my eyebrows too. It was just uh, kind of a weird time, <laughs> to say the least. But um, I'd wake up with silver on my pillowcase, you know? So, but I also. So as you look back now and you see these images, what does that make you feel? I and mean, how do you reflect on that time for yourself? Um, it, I think because I was making images so important to me and that or it makes me sad, you know, and but it also was one of the times that was like kind of like it was such a breakthrough because I never thought that like I never cared what art photography was until I start making this work. And then it was like, to me, my, I was starting to express myself. I was just like everything from the last three years for five, for whatever it was, when my mom died, just started pouring out of me. So it was like self therapy and it was, uh, and I was, I was excited about the images, you know, I was excited that I was um, transforming myself into something that I am not. Like I would wake up in the morning and wish I was in China or something. And I'd put the sheet over my head and I'd imagine being in some village or something, you know, and I'm in Tempe, Arizona, you know. So do you find comfort looking back at these images? What is it? Not so much. No, so it's more unnerving? Yeah, a little more. I Also, I think that for me, this was all shot on film and everything I did was, you know, there was no computers, there was nothing. And so my negatives had, had to be as perfect as possible. Everything had to be as, cause I couldn't retouch this, you know? And so I'd go in the dark room and, and sometimes it would take me a, a, almost a day to make one print because <laughs> I was doing split diffusion. I was, you know, and, and then I would start making them like it was uh, 43 by four, 35 inches fiber based papers. And I turned my dark room or my studio into a dark room and I built really big trays, you know, like four by eight feet. And for me, it was a time of discovery and a time of doing something that I never thought I could do because I was always pushing myself to do the next thing. Are you working with an assistant or are you doing this all on your own? Uh, well, when I would light it and I would, uh, we would do everything and then my assistant would shoot it. So, so you weren't ill at ease having somebody else there with you while you're going through. I was because I was really comfortable with her. She was my assistant for a long time and, and she did all of them you know, through the years. And it was just weird seeing my eyelash, you know? <laughs> this I'm hanging upside down. So I'm hanging over a table and the lights on the floor. So it looks like it's being lit from the top, but you know, I'm chubby and my face gets distorted. I did a show uh, at 
Arizona State University Art Museum, and I did a mosaic that was, I don't know, it was 20 by 24 inch paper, and it was 10 by 12 feet. So we spray mounted the wall and placed, and I gridded the wall, and I placed each piece of paper edge to edge all the way, and then we made the exposure. It was about three hours for the exposure, because it was like, we had to test different parts. And that to me is like, the process is like the coolest thing, you know? Now 10 sheets of eight by 10 films, $225, you know? It's like, guess I'm not doing that anymore, you know? This I'm hanging upside down. I built a device to, it's not like I can just pop up on gravity boots and be able to do that. I had to have an engine device to pull me up, you know. And there's two images, this one and another image, a restaurant in Phoenix, really great restaurant that she saw these images and she wanted me, she said she had $5,500 and she wanted these images as big as I could make them. And I made the front frames out of four inch aircraft aluminum and I had somebody weld the corners and I built the aluminum mats and, and it hung in that restaurant for 11 years and it was hanging at an angle over the table. So it was like they were seven by eight feet. And that's how my kind of this, this, this turned into where this work was showing, you know, in Paris and it, it became kind of big and, and then 9-11 happened and nobody wanted shit like this because <laughs> it was so dark, you know? You know, looking at it, I feel like it's both extremely personal and someone, someone who's in a lot of pain and at the same time sort of detached. Like, you use this as a way of expressing your pain yet detaching so abstractly. It's really remarkable. Well, thank you. I, I mean, it, it, it was, I was totally not me, you know, like I was, you know, I would like, okay, I have my assistant, like, okay, or my, or Linda, my wife would shame me down, you know, all, all the way. And um, I have my dark room, it was like 10 by 12 feet, and I put a shower head in the sink, and I had a shower curtain that, and I climb up into the sink and take a shower there with Dawn dishwashing liquid. These cones I found at the salad yard, they were like uh, 60s lighting fixtures made out of aluminum and they sold it to me for $1.50 a pound. So I got like 80 of them for 65 bucks. I still have some left over. I did a show in Nashville and I thought I would be in all these pictures. <laughs> and you know, back then it was so weird because I had a show in Nashville at a lab, it's called Chromatics. And I did some of this and some of the other stuff that was like crazy. I would probably wouldn't show now, but back then I would see the guest book and they would say something like about the show or if they hated it or if they liked it. And it was like, I always thought it was so funny, you know, because it said, like one of them said, El Crapo. And then, but I really take pride in my prints too, but. And then somebody else said, now we know where to go when we want to redecorate hell. But I looked at that and I'm like, that's awesome. <laughs> but if anybody were like that on social media now, it's a whole different story, you know? But I, I took pride in that. It was like I got through to them or I, something happened, you know? And then I started experimenting with other like transforming other people and all this stuff i found like this was like part of the outboard on a boat you know and i really that that's really thick aluminum you have to um and these there's the cones again what was the experience of shooting somebody else versus shooting yourself it was pretty magical actually because you could see the you peel the Polaroid, you're like, holy shit, man, that's pretty cool, you know? It's like part of, and I'm not trying to say, 
I'm just saying that to me, it was like magic, you know, just like even digital now can be like that. Not like as analog, you know, because you work a lot harder to make an analog yeah. image. I mean, for sure. I mean, my studio I had 22 C stands, six packs, 30 heads. I mean, now you, you, nobody lights anything anymore. Um, This one I had in my journal for about four years until I had the guts to ask somebody to do it, you know? <laughs> and um, it's one of my favorite ones. This is a female bodybuilder the day after the competition and they're so dehydrated that, you know, that they, their muscles, like it's feather, they're like feathers, but this is all, they're all painted. Silver. So um, this work to me was, you know, it's going through a tough time, and and it was, but it was like something I did that I loved, and I was, uh, and I just kind of feel like these days, or uh, it, it's just, I love my space, I love my studio, it's like the best time, you know. <laughs> I have friends come over, we'd hang out, you know, and now it's just like everything is so isolated. It seems like unless you make a effort to go out and hang out with friends or if you're in the city and you have your friends, they come over. And, um, so this is kind of where this all started um, with my self-portraiture. Um, in 2003, my wife and I moved from, we sold everything we had. We sold our house. We sold we got rid of the studio. I got rid of two thirds of the things in my life and put the rest in a 25 foot Penske truck. And I had a, a ballet company ask me to do my interpretation of ballet. So I decided, oh, I'll just put a tutu on like these other pictures that I have. And my stepmother made a tutu and it was, I didn't want to, I wanted something that would hold a tone because it was black and white. So she made it pink. It has nothing to do with what I do now. Um, but oh, oh, sorry, I'm not doing that yet. Okay, so I started. I had this kind of thing to do, and I did one image. I started photographing myself on the way here in Santa Fe. And I thought, oh, I'll just stop there and every place and do a picture. But it's like. The first one we did is like we lost two hours, you know, on the road. So we did one. We moved here, ran out of money after eight months from the profits off my house, you know what I mean? And then my uh, wife was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of breast cancer. And everything changed because I was, you know, I was having shows here, like solo shows here. I was things were going really good with my fine art. And I thought, you know, when I'm 42, I better move to New York before they splash dirt on my face, you know? So I started making pictures with the tutu um, before, just kind of to be vulnerable in the city and just to test out, you know, just like I went to, uh, to, uh, Atlantic City, because I figured, you know, nobody would really care if you're doing this stuff there. And so I started doing it. And I did like three or four shots. And then my wife was diagnosed. I called my clients in Phoenix and I said, just imagine I still live in Phoenix. And you don't have to pay for my transportation. You don't have to pay for a car. You don't have to pay for my housing. And my brother in law flew for Continental Airlines. He was a captain there and he gave me 10. But he passes, and I was always on the six o'clock flight to Phoenix, nonstop, and out of Newark. And so I was there two weeks at, at, when my wife was uh, recovering. You know, I was there working too. But then I would shoot these two two pictures, and I'd bring them home, and she loved it. She's we worked together for thirty years, so so it made her happy. And it was all about just taking care of us and myself and. Because it made me happy just to get out of my head, I would take pictures. And so it turned into 
the Two Two Project, which is, we have a nonprofit now. We raise money to help women and men right when they're diagnosed with food, rent, uh, mortgage, child care, transportation, anything people need that's not covered by anything. And uh, it went viral 10 years ago. We had our, just had our, well, actually, we had, we had our 11th, it was 2012. So we had our 11th anniversary as the two Terry Foundation. And um, uh, so here's a, a short video. Um, is there someone here? Do, do, is there, I, I should have asked you. <laughs> Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Can you guys hear this? Yeah. Perfect. Linda, can you just hold that? My name is Pat Maria, Phoenix, Arizona. And I'm going to her. Her name's <laughs> Still. Is that good? <laughs> I'm a commercial photographer, and I've been doing this for 32 years. I photograph product, I photograph brand reports, corporations, but 13 years ago, I started photographing myself in a tutu. I know what it's like with people with cancer. I've witnessed a lot of it. My mom, my dad died lung cancer and I just you know thought of the worst case scenario Linda was diagnosed with breast cancer it it made me I kind of went under after that and I was being like negative and doom and gloom so I kind of reversed that and I reversed those thoughts and I made it unstoppable fun it's all about the person who has cancer because they're suffering and whatever else they have to go through. And I thought it was very important for Bob to get out. He solves problems in a very creative way. Why wouldn't it be a tutu? It didn't seem like you could create during survival, but I was actually, that's what I was actually doing at the time was creating to survive so she could survive. When I look at those images, it, it it's my emotions. It's it is that vulnerability. It mirrors what I'm going through. She would show the pictures to the people at the cancer center. It made that made them happy. It helped time pass. I think that really was important for us to be able to step outside of ourselves and have something else to focus on by helping people. And so this sort of little idea was born. Linda wrote a mission statement and put images together and we sent it out one day offering a 20 by 24 inch print and a book for $500. This thing started like just taking off. His quest to make his wife laugh has turned into a mission on Monday Central for cancer patients. In all of this project, I would hope that I would inspire someone that has cancer that you can live full out. You, know, you have a choice. You have a choice to deal with it with laughter, which is what this tutu does. And it, it definitely opens everything. <laughs> yeah, I would say since you no longer have a pink tutu. <laughs> It's a bird sanctuary, so that's what was the law. For us, but not only for us, but for other people. There's nothing hiding in these images. And there's nothing that he keeps inside. It's all in front of that camera. Okay. Thank you guys. So this is the first image. Um, uh, this was the one before any of this others. So this is the black and white image I did for the ballet company. 
This is the first image in Santa Fe. I thought the socks might perfect protect my feet. I was not, I mean, I didn't have anything on over that tutu. I was just like, I, I, I just thought, I'm not committed. I'm pissed off. I mean, I look pissed <laughs> off. I'm, I'm, and I, and it's the only one where I've had, I, I don't wear socks now ever, um, unless it's in snow and then I, and my feet are buried. So, but it's just about vulnerability. It's just for me. This is one of the first days. This is in, this is all filmed too in the beginning. This is, uh, and I brought a strobe and, you know, a pack and a head and, and we did like seven shots that day because I did used all flash film. And it take for it took forever. <laughs> it was hot. And so Bob, when did you realize that it's you and your body is fun, it's funny, it's charming? I, mean, I don't know. I wasn't along. It, 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 I don't even think it is any now. <laughs> but, but, you know, thank God for, you know, the warp tool to push my love handles. In. <laughs> but um, I don't know, but I thought it was, you know, funny. It's like these are fiberglass. I was picking fiberglass out of my chest for two days, <laughs> you know. And so this is a road. This was after my dad died. We did a 10 day road trip with my our, a new dog. And and uh, this is uh, Wildwood, New Jersey. And see, I used a flash on that one, but I don't really use the flash on any of these anymore. It just takes too much time. And usually we don't have, you know, the police. Or coming and stuff. <laughs> this is film, and what did, and you, I, what did you tell the Bell Arena company you were going to? Well, they had known my work, but I don't know. I didn't know what I was going to do, and it was kind of a last ditch thing. And they used it on T-shirts and everything. You know, <laughs> I, I don't know. I didn't tell them anything. It was a design firm, and and I let them take care of that. You know, I. I never talked to the ballet company, but were you there when it when they opened up the box? No, no, yeah. no. I mean, it, but they had mugs and everything. I mean, it was a different picture. So this is the first time I ever shot digital. I had like a five a Canon five D with a really crappy eighteen dollar remote, and I was like, "This is where I figured." You know, it had a little like transistor radio antenna on it and so it's like i figured and um i thought shit man i don't have to shoot film i don't have to shoot polaroids before this like five minutes before and i'm like let's try digital screw this this is not so i just started pushing the button and i had it in my hand and it was like a miracle this is the first time the police came they pull up and uh they're like, uh, and I had my tutu wasn't on and, and, and I just had shorts on and I was packing up the van. And they're like, is there a tutu in that van? And I said, yeah. And they're like, and then the dispatcher comes across the his radio and says, oh, we have another sighting of ballerina on Borgata Way, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, these guys were awesome. And I still talk to, I think it's that guy on Facebook. But uh, yeah, it's been quite an adventure, and like this is I'm by myself. It was 115 that day, and that and I was standing up there. I mean, I can't. And I was by myself. I didn't have cell service either, so a lot of stuff that I do is really dumb, you know. But how much it's, money have you raised? Huh? How much money have you raised? I, I'm not sure. Like, we're small. It's only a couple of. It's probably maybe. Uh, eight hundred thousand. I I don't know. We're still small, but but we we give out like during COVID we they we gave out seventy five thousand dollars worth of gro gro grocery cards to where they could only buy groceries, and we're sponsored by Bloomingdale's and a couple other, you know, Jet Links who actually we just lost because they have a new CEO after ten years, but we picked up four more sponsors this year. So, um. We're sponsored by Deep Eddie Vodka. You know, it's like, it's been really good. This is a, a hotel that the floor was actually sticky. And and that we did this like three in the morning and it was a ballerina painting. You know, Linda hated this. I thought it was a cool hotel, but she hated it.
this one, I uh, when I saw it, it was still in fog out there, and I knew I had to do this. And we asked somebody on the crew, and but it wasn't the captain. And he goes, yeah, go ahead, do it. But just know that the captain's going to see. He's going to be the first one that sees you. I said, ah, that's okay. So I set up the tripod and locked down the focus. And I went, I went back to, it's just so surreal. I went back to put my tutu on in the van and there's a BMW with two people are like going at it in the car. <laughs> and I put my tutu on and it's like really weird. And, and so I come out and I knew I wanted to do a jump. I thought that was the most important shot. So I did it first. And then, uh, well, this guy in another shot, he's on the phone. Because the captain, within 30 seconds, they were like bringing in the police or the security. And so I had that shiny remote antenna. They thought I had a knife or a detonator. So they came to me and asked me what I was doing, let me go, went to, uh, I was on the phone with my therapist at the time. And when Linda was walking the dog and the police came, they blocked in my car, searched my car with the dog. And um, it's just like the stories never end, you know. Paul, well, can you share a little bit of something private? What is your psychiatrist thing? Oh, they... <laughs> oh man, it's this much deeper than this, you know. <laughs> but it's, it's, I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't know. It's, I have a lot of fun doing it. What's that? You kind of get yeah, I do actually. You have it with you now? I do actually. <laughs> I didn't I, because it's in my backpack all the time, and it's and it's usually uh, I don't take my camera case. I just take uh, uh, the body a lens and two lenses. I have a seventeen to thirty-five, and then I have a twenty-four to seventy, but. Normally, I shoot now the 17 to 35 all the time, but I usually have that memory and a camera, and I carry my tripod. And so it's always in there, but the camera always sits on top of the T2. This one was an old parking lot that I parked in when I was in school. We went up to the parking lot at night, one o'clock in the morning, and um, I thought the parking lot really looked cool. It was blue from a distance. I thought it's really awesome. Got in there, looked 20 minutes, couldn't see the shot. We were on the top floor. And like I have this thing where if the shot's not in front of you, last ditch effort is to turn around. So I turned around and I looked down. And it was it was magic. <laughs> it was like, holy shit, look at that. It's pretty awesome. And then as I'm doing this, a, a big UPS semi pulls up right in the right corner and I ran over there and, and I was running up just to ask him if he could move a little and then by the time I got to his window he was gone already. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> <It's a cycle. laughs> well at least he left you know but <laughs> this this one we did last year um, this was at Arches and I wanted to go the other arch the big arch and I couldn't make it because my knee was like bone on bone. But I just had a knee replacement four months ago. And I'm like, I'm doing awesome now. <laughs> it's a miracle. And so, yeah, this is Arches. And this was easy to get to. Sunrise. This is why my knee was so bad. Because I was doing <laughs> stuff like this. That's Friday night on the Bedford stop uh, in 2008, and nobody was there. This was 7.30 at night. At the L train? Yeah. I mean, there were people were walking through, but these were coming in at the same time. And I just put it on like 15th of a second. That's why the T2 is kind of moving. But, you know, there's all sorts of stories around this, and I'll just keep going because I know I... I don't have that much more time, but actually, I was doing this shot. A man came up. People start when the sun was coming up. The people would come up and they they would jog and they would come up and they would pull out their phone and take pictures of Lincoln. 
as almost as though like running, you know, it was like something they did every day. And and then a man came up and he's like, kind of laughed at me. And, and then I said, I'm doing it for a breast cancer initiative. And then he stopped and he walks up to me and shakes my hand. And he said, I just had a, a kidney cancer, my kidney removed. And he like pulled his pants and showed me the scar this big and he thanked me for what I was doing. And I was just doing it for fun and do it. And, and, and then I swear to God, 75 Marines are running up the stairs. <laughs> it was just surreal. And that was like when I knew that people appreciated the kind of stuff that we were going to do, you know. This is in Arizona. That's why the ground is so dry. <laughs> this one. Actually, I didn't have the remote, my but my assistant was shooting. And I said, just shoot through everything. Just keep shooting. If somebody walks in front of you. So the woman on the right, they came across the street. She pulled me to the side. And she said, are you well? <laughs> and, um, and she goes, you shouldn't be sitting there. It's really a dangerous part. I said, I will. I will. And I said, <laughs> yeah. This one, this is in where I live, and uh, the police came, and they're screaming at me to put my pants on, and <laughs> and then I just, all I said was, and the lady in that house, she thinks she owns this, this is a park, she, she, she owns it, but these are her swans she brought to the lake, and the, I just said, here's my here's my driver's license, and I said, just ask your dis dispatcher to look up the 22project.com, and then one minute later, they came back, and they asked me how my wife was doing, so it was like, that's why I just said, well, look in the. And Bob, do you have a title in the Virginia Limited? Um, yeah, I do. That was just Swan. This is the standard, you know, but just pretty simple ones. But um, this, I was inside. <laughs> <laughs> and my friend, my old assistant, Chris McPherson, he's a commercial shooter out of LA or he's an advertising photographer. And, and he goes, and he was staying in there because he's shooting assignment. He's just like, I'm gonna run downstairs with your camera and I'm just gonna shoot it. And I, we were on speakerphone and he was directing me and it was the only time it, a picture was ever handheld and somebody else did it. But, you know, I love this picture. <laughs> this one I just did, this is where John Ford Point at Monument Valley, everybody's taking pictures there. So I have to like shimmy across the top of that rail in it. I mean, I knew there was water and I didn't know how deep it was. But... The idea of you shimmying. That's awesome, isn't it? <laughs> so we were at a fundraiser one day at a stable and the owner said, do you want to photograph my zebra? It's like a one-year-old zebra. It was like incredible, like this, the thing was like a donkey. It's not like a horse. It's like they run like a donkey. They're like, you know, and they they hee haw like a donkey. And it was pretty crazy. This is like it couldn't focus anymore. It was probably second and a half, and I'm like sinking into the sand. That's why everything. So, but it was dark. <laughs> it was like dark. Thank God for digital. I did this actually for my cousin. He's a Supreme Court judge, or he's a federal judge in Arizona. And I did it for his wife that they made a 64 inch print and put it in his, framed it, put it in his office, and surprised him on his birthday. But the there's a story about the police with this one, too. This one, um, I was doing a photograph. In, uh, Central Park, because we, we would say, we're going to be in Central Park at 6 a.m. If you want to come, let us know, we'll DM us, and we'll, you know, and this guy shows up, and he just so happened to be just retired as a stage manager at ABT at Lincoln Center. And he goes, what, what would you think of being able to do this? Uh, hello. <laughs> this was, this was uh, we had five minutes to shoot this. 
And, and it was at a dress rehearsal. I sat, I was there seven hours before, sat down with a lighting director. We sat down at the uh, panel and we pre-lit. So when we got, he, the show was, when the, when, when it was over, he just pushed a button with the recipe that we had designed for that. And then I had two cameras in the back. I was in Bluetooth. My assistant was in the back with two cameras stacked on top and he had a two cable releases. So there was no remote. The, the only thing that failed was my uh, Bluetooth, <laughs> you know, but he was actually shooting and then he would, he would shoot seven, eight images and because it was always very static because it was like probably a half second or a quarter of a second. And that was pretty incredible. Mind the Valley. This is a really famous rock that Ansel Adams shot. And it was perfect in his picture. It was like the strife, the, the wear, the wind, and the water. And now everybody's been climbing it, so it's almost smooth. Kind of sad. But I stood on it anyway. <laughs> there was... There was probably 50 tourists on the right side of me, you know, taking the same picture. Not of me, but of the sun, sunrise. It's the big apple circus. And then after we did the, after we did the uh, American Ballet Theater, the ballet mistress's husband was the PR guy at the big apple circus. We did this last year uh, in Bloomingdale's sort of one of our biggest sponsors. And last, we did a couple weeks ago, we did a shot of the window that Aaron assisted me on. <laughs> and when I go there, I just say, do you have a ladder? And they, like an extension ladder? And they're like, sure. They don't even ask me what I'm going to do. It's like, nobody does that. But if you're sponsored by them, they pretty much let you do whatever you want. This was in the very beginning. This one before this shot, it was a game day. It was like 80,000 people. And they said, I set up, they were going to have, let me shoot for like 20 seconds. I ran out there and I, we didn't really get the shot. So I ran back and the sheriff told me, because you're really lucky they called me off. He was going to taser you, you know? <laughs> and I said, shit, man, I wish you would have done it. <laughs> would have been good. This is NJ Pack. This is Willie Nelson's guitar, which is pretty incredible. I have a friend that plays harmonica. And um, and the crew's just like, whatever you do, do not drop that guitar. <laughs> it weighed like nothing. This is Boston Ballet. This is our JetLink sponsor. We do a picture every year. This one I had my camera tethered and I had it taped and sandbagged to a, a scissor lift and it went up, I focused. And then I just like came down, got off it and I pushed, went back up and locked the focus and put it back up. And then I started shooting and I had, I could see my computer it was tethered you know, from 20 feet in the air. This is in Greece. Jefferson Memorial. Sorry. One was that. Oops, sorry guys. How do I get it to play again? Oh, I got it. So, we were contacted by DD, DDB Advertising in Germany, and they um, we did a commercial for them, and in 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 uh, Germany and uh, for T-Mobile. And when Linda was diagnosed, that's when I went into self therapy mode. So I went out and I started making photographs, and they really started to mean something to me. So when Linda came back from treatment and told me the reactions of the women, we knew that it should be shared. 
I don't think this project would have grown without people sharing. The exposure that we get and the internet and social media has been wildfire. <laughs> Who would have thought a pink tutu would connect with so many people? The best stories deserve the best network. Then they made this perfect bound magazine for like, I don't know, it's our internal use, but for this ad campaign was like huge there. I mean, they played every 30 minutes for six months. And so they did this perfect back, a story about how everything happened. And then um, this was a magazine. So this is like a, a journalist that like said that. Um, that's like the German, you know, they can say whatever they want. <laughs> But this was like, that's my, that's our house with 50 crew people in a 950 square foot house. And that's in Cologne. A news agency was shooting me down there and then uh, the police came. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't speak German. So my assistant was talking to him and but all I did was say donka, and I just like donka, 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 and I walked away. You know, and he was following me. <laughs> Luckily, my assistant spoke German. Some Coronado Island. <laughs> this is in Munich. It's called the Eisbach Wave. They surf this. It's like a skate park uh, type uh, uh, bank or uh, transition under the water. They surf it all year round with their snow on the ground. This unit. Oh, oops, sorry, guys. Did you surf? What do you think? <laughs> no, it's a super dangerous thing. <laughs> no, I almost actually I had uh, one of the surfers. Uh, I asked him to use my use his surfboard, but I was standing on that railroad tie. It was so slippery; it was like all slimy, and he had to hold me up, and I like he would run out of the frame. No, oh, dude, that's so damn. It's like only a foot and a half deep right there. And and if they fall, they fall on concrete, basically. This was in Taiwan. They do a run there that um, it's a 2 2 run. And they invited us there. This was four years ago. That's the Taipei 101. And I had my camera on the roof, and we did one shot. And um, on continuous, you usually get pretty. I mean, if you have it on continuous, you usually get one frame. The owner of the dogs asked me if I, if he, he wanted, if he wanted me to sign a release for the dogs. Oh God, I'm sorry. This is late. This is three o'clock in the morning in my front yard, and it was kind of flat and. Long exposure, and then I told Linda I to go behind the tree and point the flashlight at my head. And then it just so happened there was it was snowing, so there was water on my lens. So that kind of lucked out. And this is real, real dumb, <laughs> really dumb. And I did that three times. I climbed on that rock three times, and they put people in jail for this. But nobody. It was five in the morning. Death Valley. My nephew was flying the airplane. Bryce Canyon. <laughs> uh, Banff. That's my front yard. That's it. The CEO of Photo Shelter, going to say a few words, and we thank him for always being there for us all the years before uh, down on Union Square, and you know tonight. So I, I thank him very much. And right after him, we'll have Alex do his presentation. It's all your thing. Hello, Jason. I want to thank you all for coming tonight and uh, for bringing such. Such a, a rich group of creative people into the office uh, as, as a
we all know the uh, impact of COVID on the uh, presence of humans in the office space hasn't been as wonderful as it was beforehand. And so it's great to see people, especially creative people coming together here at Photoshop this office to do things like we've always been accustomed to doing for nearly 20 years now in, in our office or various offices that we've had over time. Uh, I've known Frank since 2007. Uh, we met under very different circumstances. And I think it wasn't until a year or two later at a PDM party that we, uh, we actually spoke into each other and realized we were working in the photography world. And, uh, and so I learned that aspect of his personality too. And uh, I think we, we all agree that everyone in the photo industry should have a, a friend like Frank. Thank you for, for bringing this into our lives as well. Um, for those that don't know Photoshop, there's, this is our office. We, we're a software company. Uh, we uh, we have two main products. We have an archive product that is your online archive, business tools, your website, e-commerce tools for professional photographers. And we have a kind of a, a big version of that, a digital asset management tool that's based in the cloud for brands and working sports teams and consumer brands and universities to help them store all of their content, keep it in one place and make it accessible to the people in their inside and outside their organization to be able to do their jobs. So that's my six second spiel. Um, we help pay for the pizza too. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Take over your computer. Maybe Frank Robinson. My prop, this uh, this chair, I have a little bit of a problem with my back, so I need a little support. Um, for some of you know me, some of you don't. Uh, some of you know the projects that kind of like I'm working on. And um, one of the things that you know I selected from the work that I do is like I selected two small series of, of projects, um, just to kind of like mostly to, to show two aspects of it. Um, and one in particular is, is more poignant and, and is something that kind of talks about um, memories and remembering. And the other was, is just more like a play project. Um, <clears throat> I'll move a bit to the mic. So you're right. Thank you. That's good. All right. Okay. Um, so this project was uh, was done kind of it, it was as a as a way to start trying to document uh, the the pandemic. It uh, it started at the beginning of the pandemic, at the height of of it, uh, where I had this uh, desire to want to be able to kind of like have some sort of a memory as to what was going on in the city. It was it was all so hugely dramatic and just the city completely empty. And I wanted to be able to find a way to document something that was not the most um, documented. Because there were a lot of photographs of people that were like, in a, you know, the, the doctors and the nurses and uh, of course the people that were kind of like dying and I tried to kind of document something that was less, you know, obvious or maybe not as, as documented, which was simply the emptiness of the city. Uh, one of the, the things that seemed to uh, extremely like uh, shocking to me was to be able to walk through this, this, the streets of the city and to basically hear echo, <clears throat> nothing else, but just kind of hear some birds flying around some distant siren somewhere. And that was it. It seems so ethereal, so like, so amazing. Now, those photographs were shown at the projections 
at the you know Frank's uh, show, I think in 21. And so I'm not gonna like bring those up again because probably they were, you know, a lot of people have already seen those. And, but I wanted to show something that was done based on them. And it was like something that, you know, came out of the, uh, I was with some, some friends and we wanted to create something that kind of brings, it's a campaign that kind of like is a memory to the people that were lost in particular. Um, <clears throat> and so we kind of thought like, what better way to kind of do it is to use the canvas mm -hmm. of the photographs that I took the emptiness of, of it and do something with that. Um, and this project basically took three years. It took six months of research and I'll talk about it <laughs> because it was quite, um, interesting as to how many things. And it basically occupied New York and Paris. Uh, Paris is because this is where some of the research had to be done in New York because the photographs are from here. Um, and so some of you may have seen, you know, this, and it's already kind of like talking about what we, what I, what I already talked about this, this part. Um, and the, the idea of the campaign came really quickly and the way we developed it was, was fast. Um, what was, you know, what took long was the production. And of course, then trying to find the right client for it. Um, and of course the right client. And, and, um, basically, um, we found the best client for it that we could have, you know, chosen. It was the ASMP loved the the work, and they embraced it, and they could, they made it made it their own campaign in memory of all the people that were lost, and that worked as a catalyst for events that they start to make that were open to all the members to send their own photographs that were taken during the event. Um, it was a very interesting project. It was wonderful. It was great to be able to look at all the work that everybody sent and then kind of see what everybody's point of view was. And this is like part of the kind of how the imagery was done. And so imagine this photographs without, you know, the, the, the great uh, films how it was done before, and the rest was kind of added in post. Um, and we found a post company that was willing to kind of work with us and, and create this uh, for me. We wanted to be able to, to use the crosses and the, the different like gravestones out of marble uh, and use them the same type of format as the military cemeteries have, like six feet distance, you know, back, front, sideways, everything the same height. And the part that actually was the research part that needed to be taken into consideration. In the, in the beginning, we thought that if we have only the crosses in the star uh, of David, um, that, that signified kind of like uh, what it was. Um, ASMP needed to be able to have a third religion that is also like, you know, kind of present. And this is when kind of like the Islamic stone came into being and kind of went back to uh, square on decided where to actually put them. And the big debate became what kind of an Islamic symbol it should be. There, believe it or not, there are a lot of Islamic symbols that are around. And depending as to what area of the Islam you're, you're talking about, you have the Middle East, you have Northern Africa, you have etc. like all these places. So I went to the Institute of World of Arab World in Paris and I met with their chief uh, researchers and we created a whole <laughs> study about what is the best way to use it and in the end their research they came back and saying that it all is correct uh, and it's more the choice should be done more like who is least likely to create an issue. Um, 
And so we opted with this treatment, which is the Middle Eastern treatment, um, so that no one from there will take any offense. Uh, Northern Africa, they use only the, they, they don't use the star. Um, it, very interesting, it's like, but anyway, this this was part of kind of like part of the factoids of kind of how this was created. And now, who are you working with to make the decisions at ASMP? I mean, are you working with a number of people, or did you go? Well, with them? the uh, I was working with the CEO, and uh, and then he was working with uh, the the various uh, the law de lawyer departments that they had, and and uh, the, the board of directors and. All of that apparently ASMP is quite a big company and they're very well organized so that they don't get in trouble. Um, so there was one of them. Another one was this one, and this kind of came as like you know, as we all go take the subway and like we see people always like waiting for the subway, and it's like, what if these the people are replaced by the people that died and they're represented by the stones? <laughs> Of course, the bridge is never empty. It's always packed. It's always, whether it's with locals, whether it's with tourists, you have to go at 4 a.m. to get it empty at some point. And then, so it seems so perfect to be able to kind of like. So Alec, you had these shots first? I had the shots first, yes. And then the idea came? After. It was based. The idea came from the shots because basically we were looking at them. We were we wanted to find a way to be able to use it, and so we came up with the idea of using the shots, adding the the uh, the homage of the stones to them, and so in a sense they're not empty anymore, but they're empty with the people that we lost. Um, so this came ended up being the the campaign for ASAP. Um, and anyway, this uh, this was very nice because actually it's like it's it started to get already kind of a recognition from different places, from um, uh, Loser Archive magazine, from London International Awards, etc. Like it's just it's it's kind of making the the rounds, and it's a very nice project. It was very very close to my my heart, uh, so I wanted to make it. In a sense, this is kind of like 360, you know, closing the loop on it. Uh, now, also, the other project that I have that I wanted to share is vastly opposite. It's not about um, thinking about who we lost or anything like that. It's simply, it's about photography. It's about imagination. And it's about playfulness. And how many times like do we walk on a street and probably we don't see 95% of it. There's just the vast, the world is like invisible because we basically see where we're going. We're seeing you know, our, where our mind's telling us to go. We know the, the kind of like the the crosses that we cross streets that we need to be able to have to get to where we go. And so I start to give myself kind of like this kind of this personal challenge of like, you know, I have to go to somewhere like, okay, so I'm going to get, take the camera with me and I'm going to try to photograph anywhere where I see the color yellow. So all of a sudden, it's very interesting because you realize how many times like we have our own filters. It's once you're looking for something that is so wide, you see so many other things that normally you don't see. And so I did this a whole number of times. Like you go after a color, you go after, you change the color, you change, you know, from yellow, you look to red, you look to orange, you look to whatever. Another time, like, um, I wanted to photograph any kind of signage on a block, any given block, that tells us what to do. 
And it's, again, it's like, it's so amazing to realize how many signs tell you in all kind of tones, don't do this, don't do that, don't park here, don't, you know, don't, don't post here. Don't, like, there are so many ways, like, the whole society tells us to not do something. Uh, it's quite interesting. In this case, um, I wanted to see, like, what happens if you actually simply do a com combination of equipment and what comes out of it. And so I basically took like a, a, a good camera, like, you know, it was like a, I think on this one I used, I used Nikon and I used a Leica. And then basically I got rid of the lenses and I didn't throw them out, I simply switched <laughs> them. <laughs> there goes my Leica lens. <laughs> and um, so I put like a very old, very big mouth plastic lens and, and wanted to see like, how do I see, the regular things with it and um, so after trying you know a whole number of times to simply like look through things and everything was just coming out pitch dark like you couldn't see anything and i realized you have to increase the exposure increase exposure and how do you get like interesting things until finally i got to the to the place where i thought it's kind of interesting and uh i call this plastic because it's it's really bad um and the ingredients, yeah, it's like this is what I talked about, you know, what's what it takes to be able to do something like that. And then just images. They're all done like that. One of the challenges to this was to do everything in one shot. No recomposing, except for you're gonna see a couple of, of things, but it's very clear that I did that. I made a triptych out of <laughs> Of it, but otherwise, it's all in one shot. There's nothing done to it except processing. It's interesting to see kind of like the ghostly shape of people. It's very like ghostly. It's 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 so interesting. Like this one was taken, for example, I think it was the uh, Lexington station. You know where they have like a big red wall, and as I was playing and moving around, it's like I realized the contrast of the red behind the crowd of people walking around it was it was such a like create such a nice rich. Uh, almost like a painting look to it. And Alan, before you go out, do, yeah. you know, do you know where you're going? Do you have a sense of, you know, I can get colors here, I can get colors there, I'm square? Yes, it's like, definitely it's like I, I, I after doing some tests, and simply looking at things. And I kind of realize what actually works for its benefit, what helps it. And uh, contrasting color backgrounds work, uh, backlighting you know, works, backlighting works, um, motion. <clears throat> like I tested cer certain type of levels of motion. Like sometimes if I'm static, how does it record an image? If I actually move with a with the crowd, how does that look? You know, how, if I'm walking with a, the crowd that moves in different speeds, you know, how does it record the people that are moving in the same direction versus someone that comes the opposite way? And it becomes like a very interesting, like a like, like a ballet of, of of elements that move back and forth. And when you go out, are you going out in a haphazard way or I'm going out to shoot now? Oh, I'm going to shoot. Yeah, definitely. Yes. It's it's all there. The only thing that's done, it's in processing. It's whether I push more, but I push in general. I I don't you know select a certain area and and push it because I wanted to see really like what it looks like. If okay, so I'm an art director by by trade. This is uh this is what I do in my in my career, if you want. And uh, so I'm so used to be able to kind of like create images. And sometimes it takes like 
when I used to work, for example, in advertising for cars, we'd shoot a car and I kid you not, it would take like sometimes 50 exposures for one image because everything was being shot in every little detail and then everything was being put together. And you look at it like, how did you get everything so perfect? That's why, because the camera moved <laughs> everywhere and it was like, it was composed. And I wanted to, to get pure reality, something that is not manipulated. Um, so you're using like a Diana camera lens or a whole lens? Instead of a, a whole lens, yeah. yeah. On which canvas? Sorry? On which canvas? I tried it on, on Nikon and on Leica. So you just mount them out? The yes. Because uh, I wanted to, uh, I, I wanted to have, I kept on wanting to try, like in the beginning, it's like, you know, the resolution on from a whole guy is going to be horrible. It's going to be so low and everything. But I wanted to have the, the, the quality of like a good, good camera that records as, as you know, as, as the, the best possible image, except that it has all the distortions and imperfections and uh, all the bad, you know, plastic lens. Are these handheld? Yeah, 100%. Of course, train passing. It's like it was it was hard to choose what to show because there are so many that are done with these and like some of them are actually like I go up front and I actually photograph them or some other times you have to you read the room if you want and you simply like photograph from your chest. It's not everybody is, is feeling comfortable. If they would only know they're super blurry and don't see anything, but <laughs> Well, when you go out for a shoot like this, are you going out with the idea to catch, capture motion, to capture light, capture both, capture people? What, what you know, what's in your head? The <laughs> basically to try to like, I didn't want to have static images. I wanted to be able to kind of like have this kind of like motion as 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 people move. You know, I wanted to capture this this truck of travel, and so with super long exposures. And I basically moved with people and exposed, 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 exposed until like I'd come back with like all of these cards full of full of imagery. And then it would take me weeks to start looking through through everything. But you start finding them. And I mean the feeling that you get when you get like a good shot is it's just really so hugely rewarding. This is cheated. Um, this is actually all done with a Leica and the Leica lens. Um, but I tried to photograph it through some very thick uh, windows that had almost like had the same feeling as the plastic lens, except that those were static uh, elevator, very thick glass, and it kind of came out similarly, but. Do you have an idea of using this for like an ad campaign or anything like that? Just for me. Just for me. I'm the best client. <laughs> <laughs> I like everything that I do. <laughs> yes. You said long exposures. Oh. Well, like for example, um, I would start at one point six seconds uh which was too short and then the the place where i started to get something that was interesting was at three seconds and then go to six seconds and some other times i'm like i'm just gonna put it on b and then just 
to see what happens, like, you know, like the unexpected part, right? And those ended up being too, there's too much light, because too, too much stuff kind of came in. But I think kind of like the optimum part was about three to five seconds. And that's it. That's, uh, this is for my apartment leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have they printed yourself to just to see what they look like on a card prints? Yeah. Yeah, the, these were actually at the gallery in Europe. Oh, what? Um, the images, I mean, it was really beautiful because the images were big. You know, they were like very sizable and um, it was cheap to print there. Uh, so it was quite, quite nice. But uh, yeah. Here, I still am looking for like a gallery that may want to be able to show something that is sizable. Um, but that's what I have to show. <laughs> um, Any questions for Alex? Well, yes. I mean, we've known each other for decades. And so do you. <laughs> I noticed, I saw these like a reminiscent of Alex. I had to know this is each other. I'm just saying, the only one I know about, we know each other. Well, it's stunning. Thank you. But I, I knew you were going to be here, and I thought, like, just for the joke, to try to put one of these images on wrinkle paper. <laughs> because we always joke that this is something that I always end up putting it on, on put images on wrinkle papers and then for re-photographing it and stuff. But uh, no, it's just, it's fun to play. It's great imagery. So thank you for, thank you for meeting me. Again, thank you for the And we go back uh, November 8th. We have uh, Amy Arbus and Michael Ruggiero who will be presenting. That will be back to Zoom. Ah, <laughs>